So welcome, welcome. Um, I would like to thank, before we start, NTAI Gymnasiet for giving us this opportunity and, and also for doing this amazing job, not only here in Sundsvall, but all over Sweden. Uh, today I had a very exciting day in the TV studio that they created with all the shows. It's, it's amazing to see what the students are doing. So. Welcome and thank you again, you and NTI Gymnasiet for this opportunity. And besides the the like deer in the headlight confusion now of yay, I would like <laughs> to kindly introduce our speaker for today, Oscar Clark from Fundamentally Games, uh, a very old friend and well that sounded well, bad. Not so much in the old. Yeah, like that. <laughs> I'm friend. very, very old. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, by the way, Oscar, congratulations. Fundamentally Games now it's a game publisher and it's a like great, great path that you guys are following. Like for the people that didn't know them before, they started doing working as live op support for indie developers and then started working deep, deeper and deeper with indie developers all over the world and now are going full on as publishers so pretty much is your path to help indie developers as much as possible and it's highly appreciated <laughs> but um without further ado oscar i will let you uh, talk and i will come back in the end with questions to help you out uh, for everybody here for full disclosure these talks are being recorded and they're gonna be uh, shared online afterwards so just so you know if you want if you think like oh my god there are so many details i'm missing something you don't have to worry you're going to be able to watch it as many times as you need also if you have questions please be very kind and send the, uh, write the questions on the chat in the end i'm, I'm going to come in and help you out and we can carry on this conversation with oscar through your questions as well but that's it oscar it's all yours have fun and I see you in a well, minute. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, great. Well, thanks for coming, folks. Um, I think we've got somebody else who's just arrived. Um, I'm going to try and talk you through. I've been given this question. So you ought to be a game developer. What next? Um, I'm going to try and talk it through. What I think is important to change your mind from the kind of hobbyist, I like to make games, to the now I've got to earn my, my uh, food and my mortgage and um, I keep my, myself uh, above the breadline. I'm now a professional, what am I going to do? So that's what I'm going to try and uh, talk you through. Um, in particular, what I hope I'll be sharing with you will give you the kind of best chance to be successful. Um, so this is the sort of thinking that I found very useful. And particularly we've observed some, you know, we, as, as Paddy said, we've been working with so many developers over, I mean, I've been around for 22 years. Uh, in fact, I should tell you that I'd be, I'd, I'd be a, who on earth is this guy in a hat? Um, I've been a pioneer in online games since 1998. Yes, I am that old. Um, I probably outdate some people in terms of, quite often I end up talking to events like this, finding out that half the room wasn't born when I started working on online games. That's quite a scary thought. Um, but we may or may not remember a dial-up modem. Uh, they were a thing where you used to uh, use the phone line to connect to the internet. Yes, I know it's hard to believe, but yep, that was the case. Um, I was working for British Telecom, which was the, uh, the telecom main telecom operator in the UK, on a thing called Wireplay, which was the second online game service in the world by one week. Uh, a organisation called Mplayer um, launched one week earlier from the US. Um, I was involved with the very earliest days of Java. Uh, mobile gaming and so I ran three the mobile operator in the UK's uh, gaming platform there's a three in Sweden um, and um, I was the global lead for games for that group uh, we were in the UK alone the most successful operator in terms of revenue per user in the world at that time but compared to nowadays it's trivial it was you know but you know still still worth mentioning um, I was also home architect on PlayStation Home the virtual world on PlayStation 3 uh, which was the first free-to-play console experience. Well, the first significant free-to-play console experience. There are a few other ones, but we were the, the largest. Uh, actually, one of the most successful um, Sony network uh, experiences at that time in terms of revenue. 
um, and uh, that shut down in 2015, sadly. Um, I was also an evangelist at Unity, and as uh, Paddy said, I'm uh, co-founder of uh, Fundamental Games. We are a living games publisher. So whether you're a PC or, or mobile, um, we are there to help you bring your game to life and manage it. Uh, and we now do publishing on that. So that's who I am. Basically, if you want to know about games as a service, I literally wrote that book. Uh, you can get it on Amazon. Um, but what I'm gonna try and do is to help frame your thinking. And please feel free to make comments as I'm going along in the chat. I'll, I'll try to respond as we go. First thing I want you to think about, why are you making a game? I, I know that sounds obvious. Okay, you, I love games, I'm gonna make games. That's not good enough. You need to understand what it is you're actually trying to achieve. So that means, you know, are you trying to communicate ideas? Is there something about the pure essence of gameplay you're trying to understand and to deliver in a new way? Is it about innovation? Is it about just the money? Show me the money. There are an amazing bunch of teams out there who make great games, but are only interested in money. Fortunately, I'd like to think most game teams want to make great games because they want to make a game for an audience. And actually that is the most important thing. Um, you know, some people are out there to make games because they want to communicate some inner truth that only the verb of a game can do. And I'd like to think of games as verbs. We do. That is a uniquely you know, attributable aspect of what a game is. We actually do something. If you're watching a movie, if we're reading a book, if we're listening to music, we're not doing anything. Somebody has done something. But in games, we do. And I think that's a really fundamental way of shifting your mind. So step one, think about why you're making a game. Step two, think about your audience. Why are they playing? And there's a various, I mean, it's a huge array of psychological models that help explain why people play games. This is my preferred one. Uh, it's basically looking at the specific elements in gameplay that really drive kind of player behavior. So I'm looking at things like control. Well, what does control mean? Well, it's about the autonomy that a game delivers. We get a power in playing games where we do. We, it's what I was saying before. It's the, um, the Yoda, do or do not, there is no no, maybe not. Um, that's a terrible joke, but nobody will get it. Um, but the idea of I control something is actually really important. How many parts of, of our lives can we truly say we're in control? A game is a unique place in that way of thinking. What's also interesting about control is control in this context also means escape. Because the actions of a game should have no consequence on my actual daily life. There's a lot of people who come into games new who maybe are very into poker or some sort of uh, gambling experience and they think, okay, best thing I can possibly do is I can give people real world prizes. No, 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 you're missing the point. Uh, Johann Hasinger in Homo Ludus wrote about why games are important because they're a defined set of rules that are outside our normal lives, providing a space without consequence. That's really important. So control and escape are all combined to me in one thought. Completion. How many times can you actually finish something? Yeah, yes, I might do the tidying up. Great, I've done the dishes, fantastic, walk away. 10 seconds later, somebody's put a new cup on the, on the side. Very, very rare for us to actually feel like we've got a satisfying culmination of activity, done, we're ready. Now. Don't get me wrong, I'm gonna come back to that. And I do want to always feel like there's some sense of unfinished business, but I think that sense of momentary completion is really important. Competence, I want to feel good. And we probably all know about Cheek Sang Mihal's flow and that uh, balance between my ability and the, and the difficulty and how we've got to sustain that level. So we've always got a tension between that point, how we also need to have this kind of relief versus uh, frustration that drives that kind of sense of competence, but also how we compare with each other. Competence is a massively important thing and play is where we can do that safely. And that's important for the psychology. And also social scene. 
um, comes from that process. In fact, sociality comes from all of these processes, you know, control, completion, competence, and the one I haven't talked about yet, social capital. What I mean by social capital is I'm playing something that other people will respect. You know, anyone playing Valheim at the moment? You probably know somebody who is, probably makes you want to go play it. You know, Candy Crush once upon a time was the thing that everybody had to play. It was the guilty pleasure that wasn't so guilty. Fortnite was the thing you had to go. If you're basically under a certain age, about a year ago, you had to play it. Now, if you go play it, wrong. But that social capital is really important. So that's why we play. Now, if we don't remember why we play, we're not going to be able to make a great game for an audience, are we? Because we don't know what needs are actually satisfying. What's really important is we're not just making a game for us anymore. That's what hobbyists do. Professionals have to make games for audiences. So there's another thing to think about. Why do people pay? People don't just magically but give you money. In fact, actually, the natural state is that people will not give you money. Why? Because they don't know what they're getting. They don't know why they should do it now. They don't know what other people will think of it. And they don't know you know, why they should stop doing the other things in their lives they should be doing. So what we have to do when we're thinking about becoming professional game developers is think, why would somebody look forward to this? Why would they desire it? How are we communicating what they want? Next, opportunity cost. Why should they do it now? Are you offering them buy one, get one free limited time offer? You know, what is the reason to act now? You don't give people a reason to act now. Guess what they do? Nothing. Even if you've got a great game, even if you've got a great idea, unless you give people a call to action, they will not act. Social capital we've mentioned. If I don't think my friends are going to think good of me for playing this game, I'm not going to buy that thing. But if I want the hat of wonder so that other people can look at me in awe, then I'm going to go buy the hat of wonder. Oh, okay, maybe not that one, but you get my drink. So we've got these pieces. The abnegation one is a bit weird. So abnegation just means setting aside things I should be doing. And the important thing about that for me is I know I should be doing the washing up. I know that I've got a client piece of work I should be doing, but my brain is full. I'm going to go play actually Skyrim at the moment. Would you believe I've gone back to play Skyrim because it's on Xbox. Um, I go play that. I know I should go play Hades, but one day I will go and do that, but I haven't done that yet. Um, there are a whole bunch of things I should be doing, but I choose because my anticipation, my need to act now, and the social value of playing now provide me with the space to give myself permission. This is a really important thing. People often talk about manipulation and free to play and all this kind of stuff. And this isn't a free to play question, this is just a general principle. We, we should not try to manipulate people. Even if we were to do so, it would only be one time and we would be punished because we would lose trust. We want to create reasons for people to love our game and to trust us so that they give themselves permission to buy. Whether that's buying the game up front, or whether it's buying inside the game, whether it's buying a DLC pack, whether it's buying a battle pass, whether it's buying an in-app purchase, even if it's choosing to watch a rewarded video ad. All of these factors are still important. And the real kicker is this stuff was decided, was worked out in 1960 by a guy called R. Bauer, and he wasn't even thinking about games. He was thinking about every kind of purchase we make. So, we have to step back and think, okay, where are these other things that we can draw reference from so that we can be more effective? Obviously, different games have different models and the simpler games can get away with some things and the more complex games need something a bit more sophisticated. But it comes down to two types. We're either gonna make a game that's going to be a one-off, you know, perfect, joyful experience. It's played, it's finished, it's done. And that's the kind of, I mean, let's think, you know, Thomas was alone, or uh, let's say the Stanley Parable. Uh, I go for very old games because most people know them. Um, but there's these beautiful things that have these one-time experiences. And 
making a business out of them is about product management. It's about knowing how you set the price, creating ex expectation so that when people discover it, they get over the paywall of making that purchase up front. That's a non-trivial process. But what you often find is initial dip afterwards. That's okay, provided you're then doing the next game and the next game and the next game. Because you need a sustainable business, a sustainable, repeatable model. What I tend to prefer and what I tend to recommend are living games. These are not trivial to manage, by the way, um, but um, or it's worth thinking about them because what I'm talking about has a very similar process initially. We've still got to get people to have enough anticipation to get past whatever the barrier is. Obviously, if you've got a game that's free to play, the barrier is lower, but it's still a barrier. Yeah. Have I got enough space? Have I got the time? Do I care enough about the genre? All these things are still factors. So we're still going to create anticipation. Players will still go through a learning process. What's interesting about the learning process, by the way, uh, in a paid up front game, when we go through a learning process, we're just learning about the controls. We already have committed our money to the game. So there's no other kind of factors really that matter. Do we get people to understand the game or not? When it comes to a free to play game or a game that's got in game uh, purchases, um, we haven't got that level of commitment. So not only are they having to learn all the controls, they're also trying to work out if the game fits their daily routine. They're also trying to work out whether they care enough to come and play later. So it's actually interesting how this later stage is actually harder for games that are not paid up front. But it's more rewarding. Because if you are able to make the experience delightful for those players, they can become truly engaging. What we find is you find people who really love the game and they will have the potential to super engage. So you probably heard people using horrible phrases like whales. Don't use that term. It's horrible. Don't use it. It was per perfect as a shorthand when we were trying to explain the lessons that we could get from the gambling industry, the valuable ones. There are some valuable lessons from gambling. The way that gambling companies look after their user base is actually really positive in many ways, clearly really negative in others. But I'm not going to go into the whys and wherefores of gambling. I chose not to do gambling because I don't get it, don't like it. But I did learn from that audience how I can be better at supporting players. And I think supporting players is a good thing. Now, what happens if you support players and if they really love your game is you'll often find they want to get more from you. Now, to me, that means if somebody loves your game, I want to give them something that makes the game experience better. And if they do get something that makes the game experience better, what turns out is that they're willing to pay for that. And I think that's okay. So finding a business model that matches the life cycle of your game really matters. And paying attention to your players and what they want and how you make them feel rewarded so that they extend their life cycle matters. Because what you may or may not have noticed is this curve's a lot bigger than the other one. You have a much more sustainable business with a living game than you do with a one-off type of game. Different models, different ways of thinking, different approaches. You need to be comfortable with what you're doing. That you've got the skills to do that and that you're able to address an audience that cares about your game. But whatever kind of game you're doing, if you don't think about retention, you're really not giving enough attention to your client. So uh, next up, how do you compare? Right, so you've got, you've got an idea of a game you want to make. You know you've got these principles to work in. We need to actually work out what our chances are. Do some market analysis. Think about what audiences want, not just what you want. Think about what your likelihood of success is for the game you're trying to make. And don't just go, all oh, right, so I'm a first person shooter and we look at all the other first person shooters. Because it's not as simple as that. You know, yes, of course, it's great to have that kind of thing. But in reality, we've also got to pay attention to the fact that not all game propositions are the same. So here are three match three games. You must build a boat is not the same as Candy Crush, is not the same as Puzzles and Dragons, and yet they're all match three games. So we need to look at the qualities of the specific game we're doing and then try to find data 
that allows us to understand what the market looks like. Because at the end of the day, we need to know if we have an opportunity to make money for this game. Now, the reason we need this is mostly because we're going to need to build a business model to get an investor to support us through that development process. And even if we're not going to an external investor, we should be thinking about that for ourselves. What resources make sense for us to put into a game? How much money are we prepared to put in? How much return are we like to get for that money? It's worth sitting back and saying to yourself as a businessman and a game developer, here is the audience I'm making a game for. These are the qualities my audience will care about. This is what they will then want to spend. And how do I know what they will spend? Because I can look at market data. Uh, Theme is notoriously difficult uh, to get data for. Steam Spy is okay, but there are lots of details I can talk about another time about how it, 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 that is. Uh, I'm talking to um, Eric Dupree, who is working on a thing called Steam Data Suite, well worth checking out. Um, on mobile, it's a lot easier. Obviously, you've got the app anniers, you've got the reflections, you've got the game refineries. There are some great tools out there. You often have to pay for these things, and they're not cheap. Um, but getting data before you start making the game will help you understand what success looks like and give you a better chance to be successful. Now, next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to try and get you to think about the game itself. Slice it up. We talked about not just going for a genre, but actually I think there's a deeper level to look at games. And the way I look at it, and this model is designed for repeatable games, admittedly, but I still think it's viable regardless. Split your game into three layers. The first layer, what is it that you're actually doing? So the start condition, the challenge, the resolution, the reward, and importantly, the tease. Why tease? Because you want to play again. So often missed off. Then I have a next layer, context. So a lot of people call this metagame. It's not metagame, and I'll explain why later. It is still part of the integral design of the game. I think it's worth having this central thing. I think it's really critical person. For me, context is about the sense of purpose and progression. So why are you playing it, and why will you keep playing it? What's the economy like? So economy doesn't mean resources in resources out it does mean that to an extent but it's more sophisticated than that and actually it's all about we talk about game balance a lot i actually am interested in game imbalance i'm interested in the hot dog hot dog economy model which means if you think about hot dogs right hot dogs come in eights buns come in sixes why well, because it's always an imbalance. I run out of hot dog buns, now I've got to get some more hot dog buns. Now I've got too many hot dog buns, now I've got to get some more hot dogs. Think about games like The Long Dark, think about games like Fallout 76, think about all these, you know, don't starve. You spend so much time trying to get to the maintenance level, storing up enough material so that you can go and do the actual task. That's part of the fun of the game. But it's also the thing that keeps you with a sense of purpose. So that's a, and not every game is going to need that. Don't get me wrong, but it's think about it. Think about what the economy of your game is and how that works. Think about the narrative, how that supports the game experience, not just in terms of missions, not in terms of the game law, but also the shared understanding of the world that your players get. You know, the more ambiguous that law is, the more commonly shared it is, the more that players will speculate about that law and we'll build bonds around it. But that's probably more metagame. Anyway, anticipation. When you go to play the game the next day, what are they looking forward to? Have you actually thought about why they should come back? Where is the sense of unfinished business? Um, I tend to use the game Kim Kardashian Hollywood as a good example of unfinished business. Obviously, I'm the perfect um, example of a, a, her target audience. Oh, maybe not. But that being said, um, it is actually a really good mechanic because you've got a series of actions to do with a series of rewards, another set of actions, another set of rewards, all these short-term goals. But unless you get through enough of them, you never quite complete your catwalk or your poker shoot. 
If you don't complete your account with a photo shoot, you don't get the better boyfriend, you don't get a better Twitter rating, et cetera, et cetera. So they've really got that flow just right. So there's always some reason to come back or oh, um mess again. Why do we keep playing? This is, so for me, metagame is what is not the game, but is around the game. So I, I include social engagement in that. So that's competition, collaboration, uh, factions, things like that uh, as a sort of social engagement layer. And yes, you'll build something in the mechanics, but the, the thing that keeps people playing is not the mechanic, it's the bond between the players. The difference between virality and the social network effect is do you feel like you're letting people down if you don't go and play today? What is it about your game that makes you feel you've got to go back, otherwise you're letting people down? You also have to think, I believe, about the lifestyle fit. So think about what your players, your player and audience, how, they, how they're going to play that game on a daily basis. Is this a game where they're going to go and hide in a spare room upstairs and play on their PC, ignoring the rest of the world? You know, I mean, that's a bit unfair, a bit cliche. But that's a mode of use. That's a lifestyle fit. Certain people can do that, some people can't. You're making choices about your audience when you design a game that can only be played in that way. Similarly, if you're designing a game that can be played in minute and a half section chunks, probably on the toilet, you're probably talking about a mobile phone. And you're probably going to need to do that in a portrait mode, not a landscape mode, because it's immediate. It's re it reacts to it. It changes behavior. So hopefully what I'm trying to get to you is thinking about this game that you're going to make in terms of what the audience needs. By slicing it into layers, we can be more precise about what it is we're trying to communicate to those players and how we can sustain them and retain them and deliver a better experience for them overall. So let's talk about that audience. For me, I like to break down three people, three personas. A primary, which is all about the mechanic. A secondary, which is all about the context. And a tertiary, which is all about the metagame. I won't bore you with why, but essentially it comes down to, I'm choosing to add more people to the list of people I have to satisfy as I scale the game design. So what that's about is being able to make it easier for me to make a simple decision about the core mechanic, a more complex decision about the context loop and a scaling decision about how I design the overall metagame experience. Because I want to make sure my game appeals to a wide but still targetable audience. There's a whole bunch of stuff that's gone into that. Um, that hopefully, if you think of it in this kind of way as a, as a new developer, if you think through all these stages, you should be in a much better position that you've got a game that's going to work. But don't trust yourself. Subjective views are going to be wrong. And I've been wrong so many times, been utterly convinced the game is going to work and find it doesn't. And it's often finding out why it didn't work that is the hardest. So capture data. Get your game in front of people as fast as possible. Do a 30 second video before you even build the game. Just build enough to show what gameplay could look like. Put it on Facebook, run it for three days, spend 50 quid a day and get the data to see if anyone will care. And it's not just for mobile. It's a good indicator for you to know very cheaply if this game design that you've got in your head has any chance at all. Then do another test, do usability tests, so tools like Antidote, like um, Playtest Cloud, that can actually do UX testing when you've got a game that is of a sufficient depth. Get an hour's worth of play built, then get it tested for half an hour and see what people actually say. People who are not connected to you, who have no motivation other than to tell the truth about how they experience the game. But more importantly than any of that, I, well, just as important as any of that, probably, is capture data in a sensible way for how people play. First thing is, don't capture a tribute, personal attributable tribute data. You don't need it. Well, A, you've got COVID compliance, B, you've got GDPR, you've got all of these kind of privacy issues. You don't want to get into that mess. It's 
too damaging, it's too dangerous. But what we do need is something which allows us to track what people do. We want the aggregate, the combined behavior, so we can make better choices. And what you want to do is to have a series of events, very simple events, with a series of data points for each event. And we want to duplicate the parameters for each event so we can track them. So if I have level starts, Level start is an activity, but it's not level one start, it's level starts. And level starts has which level? Level one, two, three. It also has an anonymous player ID. It has a time the session was started. It has the spawn point. It has any other options. If it's a multiplayer game, it's probably got a, a, a um, match ID involved in it so I can see who else has played. I want to infer information as far as possible. I don't want to capture information which is already defined by the setup of the game. There's a smart way to capture data so that you can track funnels. That's what we're after. We want funnels so we can see how people travel their way through the game. And then we can work out where it's going wrong and fix it. Think about games in general as a funnel. It's useful because what it means is we can think about it from a back to that discovery, learning, engaging, converting, super engaging. We can activate players. We can convert them to, to buy. We can build that anticipation desire, the value of them buying those things to build community aspiration. And then we can build some level of variety because of the engaged audience is wanting to get the things that the people are super engaging. So thinking about your game as a funnel will help you think more professionally about how you can build a business that creates a sustainable revenue model so that you can make the next game. That's what success looks like. And when it comes to live, it's really about thinking about what happens next, how you create a cycle, a pipeline. Uh, and some games, it's just an update every day saying something. Some it might be a, an a, ultimate, say the Spire. All that happens there is you get a daily uh, challenge. That's it. Challenge changes, some configurable fit. It's randomized, job done, top of the map. We all have the same challenge the same day. So we all can compare what we should be doing. We can see ourselves on the leaderboard. That changes every day. The feel of the game changes every day, even though it's the same game. But you can be more sophisticated. So you can run Halloween events. And week one, a first batch of content comes out with a challenge, which is a will uh, black faction, blue faction, and green faction um, get the most um, pumpkin points that week. Next week, there'll be a new set of content available. You can still buy the old content. And now it's not, you know, it's some other activity to gain pumpkin points. Which faction gets that? And then eventually you lead up to Halloween itself. And you, you know that Halloween is the last day. So you have the big event, the big transition, the big opportunities, and you're crashing all your pumpkin points, knowing that tomorrow it's going to be a new event. Thinking about events and promotions, content releases, feature releases in a predictable, sustainable way is critical. One of my biggest lessons about running games has been, it's not about how much you give people in terms of features. You can give them smaller and smaller features than you ever think. What matters is the update predictably and regularly. You can, as long as you're communicating, as long as you're doing something, the game is still alive. The moment you stop being predictable in your deliveries, is the moment the game dies. No point waiting six months to deliver things. Make sure they're doing something every day, every week, every month. And you can plan that in advance. You can schedule it. You don't have to literally stand there as a person doing it. You can plan for it. There's a whole bunch of other stuff I, I could go into. And there's so much material I could talk about. From thinking about the meaningful engagement, from thinking about the failure paradox. The interesting thing about failure is that Failure is actually a fantastic driver for people to want to buy things and want to engage more. If you don't have failure, people won't feel the game is satisfying, even if it's a pay up front game. You know, thinking about how failure works and why it makes it emotionally important. The important thing about failure is it's got to be my failure. If it feels like the game is punishing me, players churn. So thinking about engagement matters, thinking about failure matters, thinking about different forms of exchange in a game matters. Think about your economic flow, where are all the ins and outs inside the design of a game. All of this comes together into this one principle, which is that failure is always an option. 
and we will not succeed in our first game, almost certainly. And that, that person is a new team as well. Even if you've got a team of people with masses of experience, almost certainly the first game they release will fail. So we should plan for that. We should kill early. We should make sure we get games ready and run them and, and support them appropriately. This is the kind of process approach we think. So we will encourage people. In fact, we're, we're doing this with a, a, an Indian game studio at the moment where we're providing the game designs, hyper casual style game design. They're then going to build them. We're going to test them. When we find mechanics at work, we'll go back and we'll design something more sophisticated with a context loop and test that. And when that works, we'll design something new, which has got the, the working context loop and the working mechanic now with the metagame. So we're going to create this pipeline of ever increasing sophistication, but we're doing it by using lessons from hyper casual. So what does that mean? That means doing the market analysis I was talking about earlier. It means looking at gameplay data, but it also means looking at attribution data. So what I mean by that is, where are your audience coming from? Are you getting uh, people from ads? Are you getting people from social media, from influencers? Are you getting people organically? Understanding where people are coming from is going to be really important. Then we tend to do things like um, Facebook CPI tests. So I was talking about earlier that 10 second ad. Uh, recorded testing, so that usability recorded testing. And then we get into beta testing, actually getting people who are not in your team, recruiting them, running the game, seeing what their retention looks like. At every one of these stages, we agree a KPI. Success, move to the next stage. Failure, kill the game. Somewhere between the two, fix the game. Be brutal with your first games. I don't want you sitting there spending thousands of dollars, hundreds of thousands of dollars, in some cases, millions of dollars. There are plenty of games out there historically where companies spent millions of dollars before they tested properly and the game failed. They don't want us doing that. So that kills companies, that kills industries, that kills, you know, you know, development teams. Let's work out we've got an idea that people care about. Let's work out that we've got a design that actually is understandable. Let's work out that we've got a design that is retaining. Let's work out we've got a design that can convert people to spend with, whether it's upfront or in-game, whether it's through ads or some other mechanism. Let's work that out as early as possible and not assume just because we think it's good, it's going to actually work. Let's test the return on advertising spend. Whether our user acquisition is for PC or mobile, there are different techniques for both. Whatever paid promotion you're doing, you need to know that that's going to work. It could be paying influencers, it could be doing ads, it could even be social media campaigns. But at some point, PR, whatever it might be, you're going to be spending some money to make sure that you get as wide a possible audience for your game. Some games get lucky. Some games pick up a social zeitgeist simply because the right person picked up at the right time. And that's great. And I hope for that, but hope is not a strategy. You should be testing that as well. And then once you know you've got a game that works, test how that game runs. How are you going to sustain it? How are you going to have daily activities that are configured data configured activity that all they're doing is you're setting up the game rules change in this particular circumstance. How are you going to do weekly events, you know, content releases every week? And it is every week you want something to be released that people can say this game is still alive. Then you need monthly feature reviews. Not every three months, not every six months, not every year, people have stopped playing by then. But the trick there is that it's not necessarily a whole feature that you have to release every month. It could be a configured variation of a feature. So there's, there's ways to plan this stuff through. I won't bore you with all sorts of other things about maintenance of games and you know how you've got to make sure you're always constantly looking at the usability of the game and so on and so forth. But what I'm hoping I'm getting across to you that making a game is no longer just, oh, I fancy making this thing, I'll do it. Because you're not a hobbyist anymore. 
You've got to think about it as a business. You've got to think about what the market looks like. And most importantly, you've got to reduce your risk. And the way we reduce our risk is by stepping back and testing the smallest thing possible as early as possible so that you are building on a strong foundation. And if you do that, you stand a chance of making a successful games business. That's what professionalism is about. Now, that's kind of the core thing. Just a few little kind of notes. Uh, if you are making games and you want a game review, then let me know. We are doing a series of um, free game reviews where we're looking at market fit. We're looking at game mechanics in particular on that and retention design plus also monetization design. Uh, we also have an events calendar on our website and a list of finances. So we don't fund developing games. We fund user user acquisition. We work with publishing on that side. We also do live operations. But if you're looking for people to help you with uh, funding development, we've got a finance list on our website as well. There's also a whole bunch of knowledge base um, items, articles and webinars and stuff like that that you can find as well. All you need to do is, again, just pick a topic. I've probably done a talk, either myself or my business partner uh, or one of our team has done a talk on the subject. So again, feel free to check that out. We're constantly trying to update that. We're very open to um, you know, input from people about what topics they want covering. So that's the talk. Um, I am absolutely open to questions. Um, you don't have to limit it to what I've talked about in there in terms of think the thought you have to consider to be a professional. Um, I hope I've covered the material. So, you know, over to you guys, really. How was that, Patty? That was awesome. Thank you. Yeah, and I'm, I am so upside down today that I thought for a moment that my microphone was muted as well. Like I have been doing that throughout the whole thing. Now that was awesome. I will, people, if you guys want to ask questions, please write on the chat. But until they do that, I have a few things I wanted to go back and go a bit deeper, if that's okay yeah, with course. you. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. One of the things that I was saying, like going way to the beginning as well, like when we were talking about uh, the, the, the wall and how to attract the users and then the lifelong, like the different models of one. One thing I wanted, this... yes. The, yeah. One thing that I wanted you uh, to, to talk a little bit is, uh, what do you think, for example, on hyper casual games? which are this shorter time and a lot of games over and over yeah. and the change that they are doing now that they want to slowly move to a more long-term casual experience. So they are adding more live ops. They are adding more yeah. experience. Like, so how does it work um, for an indie developer, for example, would that be a good solution um, if I go and do a hyper casual game and then try to extend it once I know that it works? You got yeah, so that. I'm going to I'm going to show this slide because I think this is going to help me answer what you're saying, and I think it's a very very valid point. I love what's happening with hyper casual games. I am absolutely obsessed with it. But my focus is on long term live op games. How on earth can I square that? Well, the reason I can square that is because a hyper casual game is a mechanic. A hyper casual game is isolating just the mechanic part and doing that as efficiently as possible. And it's basically testing as many mechanics as possible, as fast as possible, to build a portfolio of games which are able to monetize because the, um, the frustration release frequency is so tight that watching an ad becomes the relief. That's the key of a hypothetical game. So it's going to be instantaneous to understand. You've got to be instantaneously engaged. Your targets and goals and success criteria should be instantaneously understood. But most importantly, you should always feel I could do better. So that's the, the tease. That's the tease part of my mechanic. And actually, this model, I, which I wrote long before I heard about hypercast games, just perfectly, I, my, my brain just went on fire when I heard about the hypercast game, game design model. And I, you know, spent a lot of time talking to the folks like, um, you know, Quali and, and Joypack and, you know, the Voodoo, you know, loads of people around that space. Now, what they're trying to do moving forward is to create what's called a hybrid casual game. What's a hybrid casual game? I hear you ask. Hybrid casual game is 
a, high, uh, a mechanic plus a context. That's all it is. It's, and again, I'm, I'm so glad that this happened to be working because I, it made me feel really happy. Uh, and we did some consultancy for um, a team, the team behind Art of War. Um, so I, I love that game, a uh, uh, Beijing based team. Um, and um, they, I would argue, are a hybrid tactical. It's a very simple mechanic, but it's got a long term retain, retention sort of model to it. Some flaws, which you know I won't comment on too much, but there are some flaws. Um, I'm going to use Arch Hero as my example. Now. So the beautiful thing about Arch Hero is that they basically made it so that there was a sense of purpose and progression. How do I know that that works? Because when I went to go and play, I was given three options. I chose which one, which meant every single time I played the same level, it didn't matter because my choices were meaningfully different. That transformed the sense of purpose and progression. And because the progression in the session was independent of the progression post-session with the rewards I got, and now I could build up my character. Now, when I played the game again, I was starting at a different level where some of those choices I could make were pre-made and further choices I made made that even better. Now I've got a sense of context. That to me is how you go from hyper-casual to hyper-casual. That's where you can start introducing in you know, purchases because you can shortcut the route to get to your upgraded character. You've also got um, essentially the, the key phrase, which I should put on here somewhere, but I haven't. I do in other talks. Extensibility. What makes mechanics work is not just that they work, you know, do this thing, do that. What makes them really work is where there's extensibility. That means can I do something through having better skill? Can I be faster? Can I do it in a shorter time or a longer time? Can I survive longer? You know, where is the grind quality of playing that? Where is the skill quality? All of these factors that apply, that's where we get our power-ups. That's where we get our upgrades. That's where we get all the things that we can sell people. And I don't mean sell people in a cynical way. Anyone who's listening to this, hearing me use the language I do, will often think that I'm in some sort of cynical kind of guy trying to still take money out of people's pockets. That's not the case. It's a shorthand because it's an easy way to explain where you're adding value for the player. We have to add utility, value to the player. And that's what the context loop is, and that's why the hybrid casual has that power. But the really, really powerful option is when you can take a hybrid casual and add a metagame. That means things which are beyond the game itself, that's the social layer that you were talking about. When you start getting factions who are, you know, you look at Pokemon Go and you see the red faction or the yellow faction duking out to take control of the gym. Mm. That's awesome. That's, that's meaningful. And I'm letting the side down if I don't turn up on a Saturday and do it. That's what the power of the metagame is. And that's where you get transformational experiences. But we're not going to all be able to just turn up and magically make a game that's got all of these components. Don't try. Start the mechanic, make it work. Then build a context and experiment with multiple contexts until you find the one that really works for that game, that, that mechanic. And then when you've got that, try to build the metagame that works for that context and that mechanic for your audience. But again, back to this point. It's always got to be for your audience. It's not for you. Mm. It's for your primary audience. That's who the mechanics for. It's for your secondary audience, who are the people who you're doing the context for. Obviously, the, the primary audience has to like the context too, otherwise it's not going to work. And then finally, your metagame has to work for your tertiary audience and your secondary and your primary because we're trying to scale incredibly audience. Perfect. Does that answer the question, Patty? Yes, it did. And I have more on that, but people mm -hmm. woke up and I have a ton of questions. So I want to go through good, the good. questions first. If I give them a chance to talk instead of me talking all the time. So uh, Mobag asked, would you recommend for a new game for new game developers to work entirely on their own in the beginning or team up with someone who has complementary skills? Um whatever you can do do it as soon as possible um don't wait to find somebody 
Um, the thing I, the where I fell, so I, I made my first pitch when I was 18. I had my, my mate who was a brilliant coder. I had my other mate who was an artist. I, I was the picture of the designer. Uh, we went to Firebird, which probably no one will remember. Uh, and we pitched the game when I was 18. We were told what a great idea it was, come back when we made it. But we didn't because we couldn't afford to. So we didn't do it. it could be 10 years to get in the industry after that. Uh, well, nine, probably. Anyway, um, what I wish I had when I was that age was access to a thing called Unity. Or, or you know, other game engines exist. I'm quite happy to say Gunreal or, or Game Maker or Cocos. Cocos are great. Just make games. Just make games. I know this is going to be the teacher you're going to get from every game industry person. Just make games. But it's true. But what I would add to that is think about what I've just said about mechanic concepts. Start by making lots and lots of mechanics. Think about maybe not even making a game. Although you want to make games, don't get me wrong. Think about making a video, a 30 second gameplay trailer. Make as many different 30 second gameplay trailers as you can, whether it's yourself or with a person who's got complementary skills. Don't be afraid to use the asset store. There's amazing art that makes that stupid, like gray box idea that you have about how you're going to make something work on a screen suddenly look awesome. And you learn how to apply the art to the mechanic. And the more mechanics you learn, the more you're going to understand where the fun is. And that's what you're trying to do. The first thing you're trying to learn is where the fun is. And again, doing this model of mechanic concept metagame and focusing on the mechanic first, and only when you found the fun moving on, that is going to be one of the biggest skills you're going to get. And it's, the great thing is, if you manage to pull it off, there are loads of people out there who want hypercache games right now. So you might even be able to make some income out of it, but don't assume and you'll probably find that you know until you actually are willing to you know so you've got a portfolio of say 20 games 20 mechanics right and then you pick from those 20 10 that actually seem to work and you spend 50 quid on each to see which of them have the lowest cost per install based on a facebook app you'll probably find that maybe one actually turns out to be any good and that's really what i'm trying to say that makes sense. Yes. So don't. So or I'm, I'm ignoring your question. I know, but the point is, don't wait. Do whatever you can do. Yes, you work with other people, but don't. Wait. Yeah. So it's it's kind of a yes and no. Yes, if you can, but don't wait for other people to do what you have to do, one way yeah. or another. Yeah. yeah. Then, Gustav Lindbis and Gustav. I'm sorry, I always kill your surname, but you know I love you, so sorry about <laughs> that. So, how long should you stay in prototyping before submitting the game for publisher or investors, or should you fake it until you make it? Kill it as fast as possible. Is the it is any it is one thing to take from this is do two day game jam style builds, kill it move on, kill it, move on. And only when you've got a person, you know, a kind of real sense of information about whether it's going to work or not. And put it this way, right? Most publishers out there are going to touch you with a barge pole until you've actually got data showing that you've got a return on advertising spend already. Now, that's just around. So, you know, different games are different. So like PC games, you might possibly get people giving you money for development, but especially in mobile, it's very, very difficult to get that money. And we would give it, but we can't. You know, that's just not ours. Um, but you can test really cheaply using Facebook. So, I mean, not just Facebook, there are other mechanisms. Um, and we can give you some advice on that as well. Uh, the other mechanism, if you can't afford it, is go do a big indie pitch. Go do one of these other... Yeah, Sophia talked on Monday. She actually talked about the big indie pitch as well. Yes. But it's worth just taking a step back and you've got to be brutally honest with yourself. And you've got to realize that while you might love the game, the reality is that you're not the best person to judge it. You need somebody who has no emotional connection to the process to judge it. So basically, yes, fake it, you make it, but, but kill it quick. Kill it quick, move on. Kill it quick, move on. And when you found the thing that's going to work, you'll know it. And that's the thing you're going to pitch. 
Uh, Oscar, if the people uh, for for mobile, that's an easy thing for the people that are working with PC because I know Gustav is de developing PC games. Yeah. Um, what same do, do the though. same works? Yeah, um, it's a little harder because you've got to build more of a game to know whether you've got something. But there's the same principle of finding a 30 second experience. The reason that works is because when we first make a decision to buy something, we do that in about 12 seconds. If you haven't got someone round in that first 12 seconds, they're not going to bother. That doesn't mean they're going to buy immediately, don't get me wrong, but they will have decided not to buy in that period of time. So if we get them to take a button that says download within those 12 seconds, we know we at least have a fighting chance. So what I'm trying to do is suggest mechanisms which allow us to test and be confident we have something before we spend the time and money to develop it to the level we can actually sell. I'm not trying to replace the development process. I'm just saying, let's make sure that what we're, the direction we're heading is the right before we put all our money in, the, in the into it. Got it. Um, actually, before I go to Humpo's, uh, to the other question, the something I wanted to comment was connected with that. The question I wanted to ask was, uh, do you, th and actually you already answered, I'm just commenting, um, the hyper casual publishers worked really well with that because they started testing the games without even having a game, just doing yes. a, a Facebook ad or having a, a little snap of the Kicks video and testing. Yeah. yeah. So for I imagine that a for PC that could work as well. Like don't make the game you can if you don't have money to make the game immediately, make a trailer and see the engagement on that trailer. So it can also go for publishers saying, look, I made a trailer, this is the idea of the game, and suddenly I have 10,000 people saying, I will play that. That's already yeah. a, a calling card for, for publishers to exactly. look at you. Yeah. We're doing that with a PC game right now. See, cool. Yeah. So uh, then, uh, and Gustav's answer is saying, great answer, thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Gustav. <laughs> then Hampus Eklund is asking, is there any advice you have for new developers that want to create a game but have limited resources at hand within aspects as market research and game development, for example? Yeah, I mean, basically, you, as I said before, the key thing is build the smallest thing you can. Don't try to build an MMO on your first day out. Uh, you would not believe the number of people who do. <laughs> um, and you can't. It's not that it can't be done, it's just that you will you will find it's an ever um, deepening hole. Um, build something simple. Look at other games in the market that do that. If you want to get data for Steam, you can get a Steam Spy. You follow the Patreon, it costs you 200 pounds, I think, or 200 euros, something like that. And then you'll get some data. It's not great data, but it's the best we've got. You'll be able to get an indication of how other games are. If you haven't got any money at all to spend on data, all you have to do is start looking at, say, get a free account on reflection and go look at like what are the in the top charts? What is there any pattern of what's in the top charts over a period of time? Look for gaps. You're, you're trying to avoid this markets or subgenre. Remember what I said about subgenre. It's not about the genre, it's about the specific proposition your game is. You want to find 10 games in the top 500 that look closest to what your game is. Track them. If you can track them for a few weeks, months, whatever, you could get some really good indication of what the dynamics of that market and that proposition is. And it's not going to be great because you're not going to be able to tell a particular number, but it will at least give you something to base on. And what you're going to try and avoid is if there's one big game. Because what happens if there's one big game is they will drown out everyone else. Classic one is location-based games. Guess what the big game is there? Okay, one go. Guess how many other games are successful in there? Two. I've done this analysis recently. Two. The rest are dead. Dead. Why? Because Pokemon Go is about a hundred times the revenue of everything else. That's the thing you're going to avoid. You're going to look for where can you bring something in your proposition which means you're different from that giant planet? How can you find gaps 
So, and that's why it's important to, to design for an audience. That's why you can save yourself a ton of pain by looking at the market, following it, doing some analysis about what you see in trends over time. You know, look at patterns. So you don't want to look at today, you look at what was this time last year? You know, how was a year before like? What are we seeing coming in and going out? Really tracking, paying attention to what people are actually saying. Don't pay attention to what people are saying in the magazines. But, then, but you do want to look at what is the trends of new games that are coming out this month. You don't want to do them because they're already being done. And anyone reading that magazine is going to try and copy the thing that was already being talked about this week. You want to find out the things that weren't talked about. That's, that's the trouble. Now, the other thing I think is worth thinking about is, again, sometimes look at the things that you like, that you think your audience will like, and then step back and go, okay, well, let's, let's work out how we can create a new start condition, how we can create a new, you know, how can we do a new twist? One technique that's really useful is to take two games you like, split out uh, you know, the, what each game does into six pieces. That's the reason for six pieces. Then you roll a dice to work out which piece from which game you're going to actually apply to your new design and try to make it work. It's stupid. And it's only a way of forcing yourself into thinking completely differently. Uh, it's a technique done by the donor. It's a technique that was taught by Sony but it's really powerful. Imagine another option is you've got your six pieces for a game design, roll one dice, and then take away one. So imagine a first person shooter when you can't actually kill people, but you can get killed. Um, where you've got a gun, but it doesn't shoot bullets. Well, have you seen Portal? There are always ways to think about games slightly differently. And what you've got to do as an indie is to do one thing better than anyone else. You don't have to have the best game in the world. You have to have something where you're showing intelligence that players will find interest. Wonderful. Sense? Yes, we have two more questions and they keep oh. popping. So Mobag <laughs> is asking you, how in depth should the game idea be when it comes to how the game begins and ends before you start developing? So again, that's the reason why I talk about start, uh, you know, me mechanic context and, and metagame starting with mechanics. Because if I can create an endless play mechanic, I can later work out the start of the end. If your core mechanic isn't fun, isn't inherently engaging, you're screwed. We're, we're so past the days of making a um, uh, Monkey Island where every single stage you come to, there's something brand new to do. It's the most inefficient way to make a game. I understand it was delightful at the time, and it was the best for you at the time. It's amazing, don't get me wrong. I, I love those experiences, but they're being done to death. Somebody will prove me wrong and come up with something brilliant in that genre, I know, but that's not going to be easy for you as a starting developer. Yeah, it's not for indie developers to do with limited funds. Yeah. Right? Yeah. and. I see the last question. The last question is easy. Any tips kill for it. getting out of development hell? <laughs> kill it, kill it, kill it. Stone dead. Stamp on it like it's a, it's a, you know. I, I I know it sounds harsh, and it's really painful. Uh, but the number of times I've been called in to review a game, and I've had to say, look, your numbers don't work. Kill it. And as a consultant, it's a terrible thing to have to do. Because I mean, it means I'm saying I'm not going to get paid to fix it. <laughs> That's why I'm now a publisher, because I can't do that anymore. I need to do something I can do. Now I can turn around and say, kill it. And it's fine. Um, but the, the thing is, you're not doing yourself any favors by being in development help. If you don't enjoy it, you stop loving the game, and it's going to show through in, the, in, the, in what you deliver. The thing that's going to get you out of development help is finding the fun. If you can start by thinking about the mechanic, focusing on that until you get that repeatable, engaging experience right that is also extensible, and you can put it up with a whole, for example, put it up with a fantasy theme, a science fiction theme. You know, go get assets that look like zombies. Go get assets that look like um, Arabian Nights. Go get assets that look like cuddly um, fruit people. Whatever turns you on, right, get as many variations. So this is a fun thing we've been doing. We've done a whole series of games where we've done 
here's the game mechanic. Okay. Here are three variations on how that mechanic can operate in the game. So let's say we've got a merge game. Okay, so merge game one, we're going to do object one to object two, and it's going to be either a good recipe or a bad recipe. Then the next version is it's always going to be a good recipe. Third one is you can only swipe right. <laughs> so we've tried all these variations, and then we tried it. One was with a candy theme, one was with a savory theme, one was with a, a, um, a potion theme. And now I've got nine games that is one idea. Now I can work out which one of those has got the biggest audience. I don't have to be in development hell anymore because I've already got rid of half of the problem. Not all of it, don't get me wrong. You can still potentially fall into development hell if you restart. up. But by choosing something that's minimal, that's simple, that's testable, that's proven, you've got an audience, you, proven is fun, you're going to make that much easier as a team. Perfect. And and just a comment before you go. Thank you guys for the questions. That was great. Uh, but uh, just comment on, on what you said. Match three, I think, is the best example of what you just said. It's a mechanic that has been done to hell so many yeah. times. But why do the companies still make, why does King still make so much money out of match three? because they had a core mechanic that works and then they just play around with that to keep the fun going with the live ops and with everything else right and that's why i show this slide because the detail so the thing about match three is the proposition has become so specific so fine detailed tune blast amazing game does amazingly well is subtly different homescape is a match three game gardenscape match three game uh, you know, there are home decorating games being presented all the time. It's finding the the nuance in the game that makes the difference. Exactly. Oscar, thank you so much. This was awesome. And thank you, everybody that watched. And and thank you again for being here on Game On Talks. And I, I promise that I will be, bring Oscar around uh, many times to talk to the developers here in the region. I'm already trying to convince him to come here personally when the, all this pandemic allows us <laughs> to have you here in person. That won't, that won't be hard to do, hard to, hard to convince me. I haven't traveled for so long, it feels ridiculous. <laughs> Uh, it's a great place you you would love it and um and then tomorrow guys we're gonna have our last talk of the week we're gonna have mo fado and marcus shield having a fireside chat with me and and if you you they are extremely experienced professionals in this read like like oscar as well unlike me yeah yeah, no, <laughs> like you, but just a different path. They yeah, yeah. they just worked in the, the biggest companies I know, like exactly. Blizzard, Blizzard Wargaming, Riot. Like you can get bigger than that. <laughs> I, I only work for a small company called Sony. It's fine. Yeah, no, so small. <laughs> Uh, but we're gonna. It's it's a great way to also finish the week having like no, more. I'm very... joking away, but those guys are great. I really. Uh, I, I wish I had time to, to join you on that as well because I I think they've got some points. Yeah, you're busy. Oh, I know. <laughs> Thank you all, guys. See you tomorrow okay. at the same time. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Thanks, buddy. See you all. And if anyone.